uh, uh, third time today we are you are seeing me and for the first time you are seeing ruben hello ruben hi conrad hey everyone uh, we are super happy you are here uh, because you will be enlightening us about the performance stuff in the Orleans Bay database. Uh, I mean, it's not the database, the whole system. So it's awesome. It perfectly fits uh, our conference today and the whole three days. Uh, you, I will just mention, you are the lead uh, programmer in the Orleans, right? So <laughs> you know the stuff. Perfectly probably hopefully. Uh, uh, hopefully so uh, without further ado I'll just go with our um, conference and the scene is yours I'm super happy to listen to it so I'm hiding myself fantastic. in the background and have a nice talk then fantastic thank you hi everyone so today we're going to talk uh, through the Orleans code base with a, a very performance focused look um, so I won't spend too much time here but but Briefly, who am I? I'm Ruben Bond. I'm a principal engineer at Microsoft and I'm the project lead for Orleans. I'm very interested in distributed systems, but also in performance tuning and writing high performance code. And so for me, Orleans is a good fit because it involves the entire gamut there of very high level distributed systems, things like distributed transactions, for example, an actor model and whatever as well as very low level optimizations. And today I wanna to focus a bit more on the lower level stuff um, because, well, first of all, I should say what this talk is not about. Um, this talk is not about who's using Orleans, for example, at Microsoft or outside of the company and why and how, um, because we've already got a talk on YouTube from about a year ago at .NET Conf about that. Similarly, it's not gonna to talk too much about the the algorithms that are involved in the higher level things, like for example, how clustering works, um, you know, how machines find each other, et cetera, because there are other talks, including this deep dive video um, on YouTube that go into details about that sort of stuff. And it's definitely not gonna talk about how to build a real world application using Orleans. Um, again, there are talks about that, and I just don't think that that's really uh, in the spirit of the conference. So instead, what I'd like to talk about is give you, sure, a brief tour about what Orleans is and how it looks to make things concrete, but really focus more on how do we make things inside of Orleans fast, especially focusing on the RPC system, so remote procedure calls, um, how we built our fast and flexible RPC system for the upcoming version of Orleans, but also about the serialization system. Uh, those two things go hand in hand. Um, the serializer inside of Orleans is very fast, as you'll see, and there are some, I guess, design tips uh, as well as optimizations that I'm going to walk through, some of them very low level, some of them more, at, like I said, the design stage, um, but hopefully providing you some generalizable advice for how to build fast systems. We'll talk a little bit about code generation, but mostly just in terms of the other two things. So how we use code generation to make RPC and serialization inside of Orleans work. So Orleans itself is a .NET framework aimed at making it easier for you to build cloud-based applications. Cloud-based slash cloud-native, you know, pick, pick whichever word you prefer, but I like cloud-based. It's mature. Um, we've been using it at Microsoft in production for, I think, over nine years now. Um, and there are a bunch of teams across Microsoft using it, and of course, outside of the company in production. Um, the core concept in Orleans is this thing called a grain. Grains are, are this building block in, in Orleans. Technically, a grain is an actor, but more accurately, it's a, it's a model we call virtual actors. And we talk about that more in this research paper um, that you can find online and a bunch of other research papers. But the idea here is that virtual actors we feel are more uh, suitable for building cloud-based systems, which are prone to failure, which have things like you know, transparent scale out and whatnot, than some of the perhaps traditional implementations of actors are, just in our own opinion. So I sometimes refer to grains as cloud-native objects because they're, they're kind of like what would happen if you took an object and said, now we want this thing to work in, in a clustered environment like the kind of thing you see in the cloud with scale out and with failures that are happening all over the place. The idea behind them with a the programming model is that hopefully you can treat your cluster like it's just one big machine. And of course, that's going to be a leaky abstraction. 
But the idea behind the abstraction is that for a lot of the time when you're building things and designing things, you can treat it as just as though Orleans is threading these machines together in your system to form effectively like one big machine, as far as programming it at least. And with grains, you divide your application up into many little objects, each object being a grain. And you might have one that represents, say, a user profile or a shopping cart or other domain specific things um, for whatever the application domain you're building is. Or you might have, you know, coordination and infrastructure type concepts like uh, job schedulers and, and reminders and other sorts of things like that. So each one of these grains, these objects gets an ID that you choose, like blog post slash .NET perf tuning, for example. It's represented by a class, so a regular .NET class, and they can potentially have some persistent state or maybe many pieces of state or no state or purely in-memory state if you've got soft state in your system. So they're very flexible like that. And Orleans will spread these things around the cluster for you. So when you add more machines to your application, Orleans will take advantage of that and new activations, new grains will be instantiated on those new machines to fill up the, the newly available space. When you remove machines, the cluster will contract and the grains will be activated on the remaining machines only. So by doing it like that, it can handle scale out, scale in, and also at the same time handle failures, which are prone to happen. And Orleans will make sure that these grains are available for you when you want them. So it'll automatically load them into memory and then once they're not needed anymore, you know, they've become idle for some period of time, it'll unload them. It's very similar to uh, virtual memory, like memory paging, for example. Uh, effectively, they, they're like it pages out of the database. The important part for today is that Orleans will make sure that any method calls made against these grains get routed to that instance of the grain. So if you have a, a grain reference that represents like a particular blog post, for example, then any calls you make against that reference always go to the same instance. Um, and Orleans, uh, in order to make things easier to program, we make these grains single-threaded. It's not that important for today's talk, but the idea behind this you know, very actor-like uh, way of doing things is you get less bugs, um, you don't need to use locks, and writing uh, to storage is a lot easier to coordinate, so you have a lot less conflicts. The benefits of grains, uh, therefore, are something like that you can reduce the amount of database reads because these things can cache warm data or hot data in memory and leave that cold database, that cold data in the database. You don't need to have a separate cache like Redis um, because you can just store them in memory. You don't duplicate it around the cluster. Um, you also have less database write contention because each of these single threaded grains effectively is responsible for its state. So if I want to update a blog post, for example, I go through that blog post grain it can coordinate the writes. And so there are no write conflicts and the database doesn't have as much write contention. And because Orleans manages the instances of these, you don't have to deal with cache coherency issues so much. Um, because Orleans will scale these things out for you, you get good scalability just by dividing your system into grains because Orleans will spread them over your cluster. Again, because of the coordination and caching, uh, cache coherency benefit, you don't need to use queues slash workers in order to do these database writes for you. And so you can optimize for lower latency writes by just going directly to the database. And hopefully the upshot of all of this is that you end up with less code, less infrastructure, hopefully less error handling and retry logic, less coordination logic, et cetera. So that's all I'm really going to say about, I guess, the programming uh, model or the benefits of using Orleans. Let's talk about a concrete example so hopefully this is not too blurry, but here's, here's an entire application um, built using Orleans. And this is using the new uh, .NET minimal APIs that are going to be released with .NET 6 next month. So you can see this new web application builder here. But just going top to bottom, the application involves creating this I hello grain. Um, so we define this grain interface for how we're going to talk to some grain that we have in our application. It inherits from my grain with string key to say that it's a grain and it's identified using a string that we're going to just some user defined ID we pass in later. And it has a single method that takes a string greeting, returns a task of string because all of the methods have to be asynchronous in Orleans because they might be remote, they might be local, but either way, uh, grains are single threaded, so you can't call them synchronously. Then we implement the grain by deriving from this grain type helper class, implementing our interface 
and just in this version, we just simply synchronously return some templated string here back to the caller. So after we've defined our interface and our implementation of that, we need to go and uh, instantiate all in to start it. So we create our web application builder. We just call use all leans. And because this is only a, a simple demo on a simple box, single box, it just says use local host clustering. So this won't scale out. But if you want to scale this out, then you just have to change one line here to say, you know, use Azure Storage for clustering or Cosmos or Redis or something else. Back to the more important stuff. In order to be able to call into one of these grain instances, we need to first get a reference to it. And so we call this grain factory and we say get grain of some type, the iHello interface, give it some ID. It doesn't really matter what this is in this example because it doesn't do anything with the ID. But So we just want to get a specific instance of it. And then we call it just by making a, a regular method called. And so this, this uh, HTTP method here that's mapped using the new minimal APIs is going to say that if you hit the slash hello endpoint, I'm going to call that hello grain and pass in this string. And so I'll get back hello, comma, hi for minimal APIs, exclamation mark, and that'll be printed out to the caller. And so you can see a whole application in, I don't know how many lines of code this is, but it fits on a screen very easily. It's rather simple to get started with. Now here's a more complicated example. This is just here to demonstrate what it looks like when you have state. And so in this case, we've got this dictionary entry grain that's taken from a sample that implements a, a bilingual dictionary. It's a English Chinese dictionary, and I'll link to it later. But in this case, we're seeing that we can inject this state uh, type into the constructor. Um, it's very similar to Azure Functions in that you've got this kind of binding type attributes on here that says you know, what the name of the state is. But you don't see any database hookup here. There's no connection to a database. That's all configured at startup time. More importantly, this is how you update some state and how you read state. Updating state is as simple as updating the in-memory state with some new value. In this case, let's say we're updating a dictionary definition and then writing it out to the database. But on the read side, the whole thing can be completely synchronous. And so we don't have to do any reads. We just synchronously return our in-memory state back to the caller. All these will always guarantee that this state is loaded before this, before this ever gets called. So again, with a grain factory, we're getting an instance of it. We're calling it. Uh, in this case, we might have one dictionary entry per word. And so maybe if you had some word, like you wanted to know what ni hao means, then you might create an iDictionary grain with ni hao as the head word here. It'll go and find that the grain will load up its, its dictionary definition and return back the result. Um, the definition once you call get definition async. It's a little bit contrived, but it's it's realistic enough, I think, for our purposes. The more important thing here is what happens behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, you might you might just pick this up just because of your experience, but Orleans is using RPC. It's using asynchronous remote procedure calls. And so it's very similar to gRPC, except that in our case, you're not targeting an entire service, but you're instead targeting an individual object instance. So, you know, a particular dictionary entry object or a particular I hello grain object instead of the whole service. And another difference is that because Orleans is very much built for .NET, it supports things like generics and polymorphism and having method overloads. And um, oddly enough, having multiple parameters per method, which is um, not supported in gRPC out of the box and other kinds of .NET things. Behind the scenes, what's going on is Orleans has a code generator, which is a C-sharp source generator that inspects your application, inspects your code, and it's going to emit uh, two types of classes for your interface. So when you have a grain interface, it's going to create this implementation of a grain reference, which is it's a class that turns your method calls into messages that Orleans can send over the wire. And this grain reference that it generates is going to implement your interface. So I hello grain or I dictionary entry grain. Then it's also going to generate one class for each of the methods on that interface. So the say hello method or the get definition async method, et cetera, they're going to have a class that effectively represents that method call as well as all of the arguments that you pass to the method. And we call that thing an invocable. It implements this I invocable type in all leads. So the way that you interact with this is that when you call that get grain of t uh, method on the grain factory that we saw in the previous slides, Orleans is going to actually give you back an instance 
of the grain reference that was generated for that interface that you provided. So you get a proxy object back and it doesn't know where that grain lives, if it's even active in the cluster at all. Uh, actually, what it does is it just, it's effectively like a URL uh, wrapped around an interface. It, it's a pointer to this grain that may or may not exist. And so it's location transparent. If you think about the way that the uh, call flows throughout the system, here's a kind of simplified view of it. We have our caller, which might be our code that we saw calling get definition earlier. And that's trying to call a method on this grain reference that it's got. That gets turned into a message that represents that get definition call, in this case with no arguments. And then Orleans is responsible for finding an instance of that grain. But once it does, it's going to send a message that might end up going over the network, or maybe it'll be in process, which is more efficient, of course. And then it's going to enqueue that message on the grain. And once that grain uh, gets to that message, like it's drained the rest of its queue, then it's going to go and execute that message and call get definition, which will just synchronously return the state that it already has in memory. Um, and that will get returned as a response that gets um, wrapped in a message again and routed all the way back to the caller. Now, this aside here, just saying that the state is connected to some database, you saw the write state async call, but Orleans manages the read for you. So you never actually have to call read state async because it's called before your code ever ends up running. So what if that grain is not active anywhere? Well, Orleans uses something called the grain directory, which is very similar to DNS in that it takes a, a grain ID and it finds where that grain lives in the system. And there's an inbuilt version, which is a distributed uh, partitioned in memory system, or you could use Redis or Cosmos DB, it's very pluggable. And it caches lookups and handles invalidation. Th so things are optimal and fast. But if the grain is not around, if it's not active anywhere, then Orleans needs to place it somewhere. And so it uses placement for that. And there are a whole bunch of different kinds of placement um, implementations you can use on a per grain basis. So you can say, I want to place this randomly or locally or on the least loaded instance, or you can customize it so that it goes right next to where the data that that grain is going to need lives, et cetera. Um, and to put this into, into context, we have our same call that we made before where we have a, a caller calling into some grain, but I've drawn in the middle boxes, the middle boxes this time. And so we've got two app, two instances of our application, my app here on port 4444 and another one here on this other port. And behind the scenes, Orleans is taking this message that we create. It's saying, all right, with that message, where do I find that grain? And so it asks the placement system to get or place this grain. The placement system then delegates to the directory. In this case, we're using the distributed directory. And so it tries to look it up. And in this case, the partition that's responsible for the grain lives over here. And so it makes a call to the other machine and it says, or well, the other app instance, and it gets a result back saying, okay, the grain is on this uh, port here. It's on this instance here. And so that gets stamped onto the message and it routes the message here, gets executed, and it routes the result back to the caller. So you can see that RPC is extremely important in Orleans because anytime you make an interface call, that's going to involve RPC. Um, and our philosophy is that developers should be free to model their types and interfaces as they see fit to give them maximum flexibility on how you want to model your domain. We also want to minimize the amount of ceremony. Um, so we don't want to have you to say register everything or to explicitly mark things up. Uh, where you don't need to. But instead, we, we just say that as long as you inherit from a grain interface, we're going to generate some RPC types that I mentioned before for you. You should also note that all of the stuff I'm talking about today, as far as serialization and RPC is concerned, it's all sort of pub -ternal, like publicly accessible, but theoretically it's internal. So you can take this uh, serializer RPC and use it for other things, like say, for example, um, a database journal, um, or you could use uh, event sourcing if you want to have method-based event sourcing, which is kind of a different flavor on things, or code-based workflows are another example. It's usable for a bunch of different things, or maybe just simple IPC or RPC that goes over HTTP instead of Orleans. You know, this could be used for any of those things. So let's look at another example of how the RPC works. So here's an interface, it's a grain interface, it has a single method, it's generic, and it just echoes some value back to the caller. 
the things I want you to see here or note here is that the method itself can be generic, but also the interface could be made generic. Um, we're only going to generate proxies for things that inherit from some I grain of star, I grain of blah type. Um, it supports overload, so you can have multiple echo methods. You can have any number of parameters you want, but it's only going to support serializable types. And the return type could be value task for efficiency purposes to reduce allocations. Um, you can actually have zero alloc RPC here uh, with the right amount of pooling internally uh, if you use value task. Uh, but you can also use task or task of t, just a little bit briefer. Now, I mentioned that we're generating some types. So here's a snippet of the generated code that we created. And this is what corresponds to that previous interface. So we have our generated proxy for iEcho grain. It implements this grain reference type, which has a, a few helper things on top on it. And it implements the method, sorry, the interface that we specified. And so you can see the implementation of the echo method here. It's generic, just like the method was. It implements it exactly. And internally, this method, what it does is it takes these arguments, it creates this invocable object, which is that second type that I said we generate, one per method. And then it sets those arguments as, as fields on that object. And then it submits it to the runtime and says, you know, go and invoke this thing. And so the runtime is now responsible for creating or um, locating that grain, sending the message and waiting for the response. And the response that we get back here is actually going to be a pooled reusable type. So it's a, a reusable awaitable type. So it doesn't need to allocate here, which is a nice efficiency gain. These objects can also be pulled too, but in this case, it's not. Okay, trying to blaze through it. Here is the implementation of that invocable object type. And I think this is one of the more interesting parts about the way Orleans does it, because most RPC systems that I've seen do not do it like this. So we create this per method type closure that represents the arguments on the method. And because the method was generic, this has to be generic too. If the interface was generic, this would also be generic. So we have these three fields that represent the method arguments. We also have this target instance that we're going to use later when it comes to, to invoking it. And so you saw before that we set the values here. On the other side of the wire, when it comes down to actually executing it, you can see this invoke inner implementation that we code generated. It just says, call the method. It takes each of the arguments, passes them into the method, the original method with T. The reason we do it this way is for one, it's very efficient instead of having to have, let's say a switch statement or nested switch statements. Um, more importantly, it helps us to avoid having to do overload resolution. And overload resolution can get extremely complicated. Um, and so this offloads all of that onto .NET and says, I'm effectively just writing the exact same code the user did originally. And so it'll be the exact same method that gets invoked uh, at the end of the day. The remainder of this class are various different types of helpers that are used for kind of reflection-like capabilities that we give developers. So if you have, for example, you want to have a middleware that does distributed tracing or logging or retries or something like that, you might want to be able to print out the method that's getting called or some of the arguments of it, or you might want to look at an attribute on the method so you can reflect onto that if you want. Uh, but, but by doing it this way, we can make this very efficient uh, implementation of doing this. Of course, it still involves reflection for method info, but it's it's much more efficient than actually reflecting and or trying to do overload resolution again to get the method info that corresponds to this echo of T type or method rather. So that's an overview of how of how the RPC in Orleans works. The next bit is probably a little bit more in depth because we talk about how serialization works. Um, and there's a lot more optimizations involved here. So serialization, very similar to RPC, is extremely important. They really go hand in hand. Um, one of the major differences in serialization is that we really want to avoid any kind of magic. We don't want to be able to serialize any random types. Um, and so we generate all of the allowed serializable types up front um, because that's otherwise it's a security risk. Uh, and also because we support version tolerance, we need the developer to actually mark up the serializable field with some sort of attribute that says field one, field two, field three, field four, et cetera. And you might ask a very legitimate question, which is, 
why did we build our own serializer at all when there's things like protobuf or other serializers out there that are you know very capable it's a good question and the reason for it is that in orleans we really want to reduce the amount of burden that we place on developers and we want to give them as much freedom as possible um, and we also want to support .NET types very well. And so, if, you know, in .NET, we have things like polymorphism and generics. We have hierarchies of types, and you want to, we want you to be able to version, you know, add or remove fields from base types without affecting derived types, for example. And if your application calls for having cyclic graphs, then we want you to be able to reference that without having to jump through hoops. Um, Again, version tolerance is extremely important, and a lot of the more flexible serializers out there just don't support version tolerance well or at all. Whereas it's very important for us to be able to support different kinds of things that you can do on the type um, without also making it uh, unversionable. And it's also very high performance because we do a lot of serialization. Anytime you're calling um, across the network, you're going to serialize something. And so it needs to be fast. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about this. Again, these things don't reference Orleans, so you can actually use them independently, even though the DLLs are named Orleans.serialization. And the serializer goes hand in hand with the RPC system. So you saw those ID fields potentially on the RPC system. So is it fast? Uh, here is a benchmark that, that I optimized the serializer for. Uh, this benchmark was originally taken from Message Pack. Um, and you can see Message Pack is very competitive on this, um, but I put into a lens just so that we can have a target to optimize for. And you can see that, yes, it's, it's fast. It, it's fairly compact representation, not the most compact, but rather compact. It doesn't allocate any data unless it needs to. In this case, we're creating a class. Um, and generally, it's, it's high performance. And a lot of these other serializers are also very high performance too. But what I want to talk about is what makes it fast. And there's a few aspects there that are important. And you really need to think about performance here from the beginning. Before you even write any code at all, you need to think about how can I design the type system um, in this serializer or the interfaces so that they support high performance serialization. So we'll talk about that. How can I design a wire protocol that supports high performance serialization while still supporting all of the features that I need? And also, sometimes you might be faced with algorithmic choices. Um, so how can how can I choose algorithms that are optimizable? And then there's general purpose optimizations that we'll gloss over. So the serializer in Orleans is based around this one interface primarily. This is at the, at the bottom of everything is I field critic. It encodes and decodes fields. Um, the things I want you to notice here, we've got a write method, a read method. They, the write and read methods both take mutable, ref, um, mutable structs by reference. And this allows for very uh, low cost abstraction here. We can, we can allocate these structs on the, on the uh, stack instead of on the heap because they're structs and we can modify them. And so we don't need to allocate them or pass them around as big objects. Also they're generic, which allows us to support multiple different types of buffers um, without having to pay a penalty for that uh, by having abstract classes or indirection. And it's by also making them generic, we can allow the JIT to specialize them based upon type parameters. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. Another important aspect is that we, we encode everything on the wire using deltas between fields. We don't encode the actual field ID of field one, field two, field three, field four. We just encode say one, 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 because each field is only, the difference between one field and the next in terms of the ID is just one. And this allows us to pack the field ID into a single byte um, that gets shared with a few other things like the type and, and some other things like that. Knowing the expected type um, allows for another optimization where we can also avoid encoding the type if we know what type we're encoding and it's the type that we expected based upon the serialization or deserialization. And finally, an obvious one is that we don't want to box value types. And so we take them in as concrete T instead. So, you know, an int doesn't need to be a box into an object just so that it can be serialized or read. Okay, so I mentioned that we want to be able to be flexible and support a variety of input and output types, but we don't want to sacrifice performance. And so these are some very low level types internally in Orleans for reading and writing bits to some buffers. And you can see that we've got these helper methods for creating a reader based upon a stream or a read-only sequence or a span. 
Um, and similarly for Rider, we've got a huge number of variants here. And by using um, value types here as the generic parameters, we can do a nice little trick, which is we can optimize this reader on a per type, per generic parameter basis. So the JIT will actually generate a different code um, for each value type combination that you pass in here. And so you can see an example of that where we've got static fields here that are going to be generated per type. Um, that just do simple type checks. So say if the input type is this, then this is true. If it's that, this is true. Otherwise, if it meets this match, then that's true. But the way we use that is uh, well exemplified here. You can see this position property that says how far into the stream we are. We've got a if statement for each of the different potential input types. And because the JIT, when it generates x86 or ARM code or x64 code, knows exactly what this is based upon the input type, it can actually eliminate this check and it can eliminate all of this dead code. So this position ends up just being three adds if you passed in a read-only sequence or just two adds if you passed in a span or a, or a byte array. Uh, and in this case, we don't eliminate it because the JIT will not generate unique code for reference types and reader inputs a reference type. Okay, I mentioned that the wire protocol design is also important. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but the basic wire protocol on this thing is that we have a byte size tag followed by some optional metadata and then the payload. And we try to stuff as much information into this one byte tag as we can. So we've got three bits that are dedicated to the encoding type on the wire. And then we've got two bits that are dedicated to the schema type, which is really another word for the runtime type. And so we separate the encoding and the runtime type separately. And then we have three bits that are dedicated to the field ID delta. So if the difference between two subsequent fields that we're serializing is less than seven or less than equal to seven, then we can all encode that in just the tag. We don't need to spill over into extra bytes to do that. And if the type that we're encoding is exactly what we expect it to be, then we can just say that it's encoded uh, as the expected type in the tag, and we don't need to have any extra bytes here. And so that gives us a nice compact representation. It allows us a variety of different encodings. It's very flexible because we can encode just about any of that type. Um, and we can also en avoid encoding types or values multiple times if we have a reference type. And this is what allows us to support graphs, for example. OK, um, I also I think I've been doing OK on time. Um, I mentioned algorithmic choices as something that you will sometimes face. and in this serializer, it's extremely important that, that variable length integers can be encode, encoded and decoded efficiently because we use them all over the place for things like field ID deltas or for integers that get encoded or for type IDs and things like that. And so this needs to be very fast. But the algorithm that's most commonly used for variable length integer encoding, which means an integer that's encoded in a minimal number of bytes, it's not very fast. Um, and that's kind of a, a, it's simple to implement, but it's kind of a, a downside to it is that it's a little bit slow. It involves setting a, the most significant bit in each byte to indicate whether or not another byte follows. And so a one at the start of each byte indicates whether or not you need to read another byte and so on. And so that requires branching and loops. But what if instead of doing this, we store all of the length bits or the length information in the first byte and then we can hopefully eliminate the need for branching. And so we don't need to read multiple bytes. We can hopefully get all the information up front, hopefully eliminate branching. So the baseline here, this code is taken from binary formatter. And this is an implementation of that simpler algorithm where we set the most significant bit in each byte, depending on what the value is. And you can see it involves a loop and a few instructions to do a bit shift and a, and a or here. Um, but basically, this is very minimal code, but it's not as optimal as it could be. And so an implementation of an optimized algorithm looks something like this. And so here's the implementation from Orleans, where we're writing this different type of variant um, using this other algorithm. And the basic flow of it is that we calculate how many bytes we need up front using a CPU intrinsic here that, that gets uh, polyfilled on, on other uh, runtimes. We determine how many bytes we need. We shift the um, write cursor by that amount for the next uh, next call to write that we make. 
And then we, we basically shift the input by the number of bytes that we need so that we end up with zeros um, to indicate each successive byte. And so the number of trailing zeros will indicate how many bytes after the first one is required. And so, and, and then we do an unaligned, potentially unaligned write of all of this. So this, this group of three uh, method calls, I think it ends up usually getting, the JIT usually turns this into just a single instruction, I think. It's, it's very cheap either way. But all of this doesn't involve any branches. This ensure contiguous thing here does, um, but this is otherwise very cheap. Um, so it's very optimal, optimal algorithm for doing that. Unfortunately, the read side is a little bit more complicated. You might have noticed on the right side that we ended up writing potentially eight bytes, even though our input's only four bytes. Um, now on the right side, read side rather, that means that we might be reading some junk data when we read things. And so the algorithm is a little bit more compl complicated, but essentially we still read, we read eight bytes of data and we've ensured that we're allowed to read eight bytes of data up here with the few uh, conditionals that we do need to make. Then we compute how many bytes we needed by taking the trailing zeros count. And again, the first byte doesn't count, so we add it on here. We shift the data back into its correct position because we, we shifted it the other opposite direction uh, originally. We move the read cursor. It's not really relevant for this. But then we also need to mask off the invalid data. So because we overread uh, the number of bytes, now we've got some junk data potentially um, in, our, in, our, in our data here. And so we need to get rid of that. And so this bit twiddling effectively computes a mask that says we can eliminate the uh, invalid data from there and then just simply return the result. So again, this doesn't involve down here any conditional checks or no branching. All of the branching is done up here and determines whether or not we need to take the slower algorithm approach. So after, after those kinds of things, there's also all sorts of general optimizations which you can take. For example, you want to reduce branching like I showed you, reducing memory allocation, avoiding boxing, uh, avoiding indirect calls is very important as well, inlining correctly, so maybe that means using throw helpers, etc. removing bounds checks on loops, um, all of these kinds of things, um, but only do these things if you're constantly measuring your code. So don't do these things just on a hunch. Like David Fowler said yesterday, oftentimes your intuition will be wrong. Um, now you may ask, how do I know when I need to do one of these things or when one of these things might be appropriate? Um, aside from the design time uh, decisions to make sure that these things, that your code is amenable to performance, you need to measure, experiment and keep measuring. Um, but you can also examine the JIT's assembly output using either benchmark.net or this Disasmo VS extension, um, which gives you the generated assembly code. Uh, and there's some websites that can do the same thing as well. But this kind of stuff is very useful for when you're doing this micro-optimization. There's more detail on all of these kinds of optimizations on this blog that's, I think, almost three years old now, but still very relevant. Um, on my GitHub on .NET perf tuning, you can see there. Okay, um, I haven't talked much about the code generator, uh, which is, I guess, called a source generator now in Orleans. And I'm not going to talk too much about how it actually works, but I will show you what the generated output for a serializer looks like and talk a little bit about some of the uh, performance concerns in there. Now, the goal, of course, of the source generator is to emit high performance C sharp code. Um, but it does get complicated, especially the code generator itself. Um, and especially when you're trying to optimize for things, you end up putting special cases in, and I'll show you what that looks like. So this is the type that we were benchmarking at the beginning when I showed you those four benchmarks. It's a struct or a class that has nine properties on it. Each one of them has an ID, um, and they're just all integers. So it's pretty simple, not a very representative kind of type but it's good for this purpose. Now, Orleans will generate these serializers that, that need to be able to write types like this. So it takes in a writer by ref. Um, and like I said before, because a code gener generator needs to generate optimized code, um, it actually has knowledge about things. So it knows, for example, that a integer property, we don't need to do any indirection. We can just 
statically encode that we use as in32 codec to write it. We don't need an instance of it that we would get via, say, dependency injection or by doing some kind of lookup. We can just directly write this field out. And you can see here we take that writer by ref. We encode the field IDs here and note that they're all just a difference of one. So the delta can all be packed into a single byte in this case. The expected type is always going to be equal to the actual type because it's a value type and it cannot vary. Um, and so that means that we can avoid serializing the int32 type on the wire. We can just use that schema type dot expected. So that comes back to that wire type, uh, the wire protocol again. And then finally, we need to omit one call per property because we're going to serialize them all one by one. That's very straightforward. The code for the deserializer is a little bit more complicated um, because we need to be version tolerant. And because of that, it might mean that someone inserted a field you know, between ID 7 and ID 10, for example, or ID 100. And so we need to be able to deal with potential uh, changes where we're deserializing some data that was serialized by a different version of the code and things have changed. But this is an attempt at emitting optimal code for doing that. And so we basically read some tag off the wire and if the ID matches a given field, then we deserialize that particular field and then we read the next tag and so on. And this looks very much like a kind of unrolled loop. This could instead be a switch statement that just does a single read up the top and then jumps into a switch table uh, depending on uh, what the particular ID was. Uh, and that would actually be better potentially in some cases. So it would be nicer on the instruction cache because it doesn't involve as much code getting emitted. But as far as the benchmark was concerned, it was not as good for the branch predictor. Now, of course, that's one of the flaws of micro benchmarks is you might end up doing potentially silly things like this, like unrolling code for performance reasons, which might not actually produce a real world benefit or might actually end up being slower in the real world. And so depending on further benchmarks, I may go or we may go and undo this and go back to the minimal code version instead of this unrolled version. Uh, and yeah, so because it's version tolerant, it potentially might need to see, it potentially might encounter some type or field that it doesn't know about, and it needs to skip over that. And so that kind of falls into this slow case. This while loop here really could be a go-to label. It, it could be more linear looking. Okay, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. Um, Orleans is feature rich, but we're not really talking about those features today. Um, there's other talks, again, that talk about it. There's a lot of good samples here on ak.ms slash Orlean samples that show you how to build realistic apps or deploy to Kubernetes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can see Spectre on this app here is an awesome client library. And thank you. Uh, we have a very active Gitter community here um, that you can come and ask us any kinds of questions or just talk, uh, our GitHub and the blog post that I referred to before. Thank you, thank you. Awesome talk, like meaty one. We like that. <laughs> you know, My big bites. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, two questions, which are like more feature feature related, not performance uh -huh. related. But having you there, probably we need to ask them. <laughs> so first one sure is. Uh, probably the question that we are pretty used to, uh, like how you would recommend or compare. Or I would say like... that this this really depends on a lot of things. I don't think it's a, a question that I can really fairly answer. I think that you should look at both, decide which one works best for you. Um, there are some comparisons online that you can find. And uh, generally speaking, Orleans is kind of more automated. It abstracts a lot of things away from you, whereas Acura is a little bit more manual, um, which has its pros, of course. Um, but also involves a slightly different way of thinking. Orleans is very sort of .NET object oriented kind of approach where you've got objects and you're making method calls. Whereas with Acker, you really do have that kind of message passing paradigm. And so it's a, it's a bit different. Yep. You need to dig in into the comparison articles and other. Uh, another question is, <clears throat> Uh, how do you manage read and write to a single database using Corlins? Uh, uh, so let's say that you've got a an Orleans application and you're writing or reading to Cosmos DB. 
you can just do what you would normally do in any application. So Orleans doesn't interfere with, say, connection pooling or you know database reading or writing. You can just use direct Cosmos DB calls if you want to. Um, and we recommend that if you, for example, maybe you, you want to use some specific features of Cosmos or you want to have a lot of control over how your data looks. In that case, ju just use it directly or use an abstraction layer that you think is appropriate. The benefit of the Orleans abstraction layer is that it's very simple, but I think we would be uh, wrong if we tried to say that this is going to satisfy every need. You know, maybe you want to use Redis particular data structures, or maybe you have um, transactions in Redis, for example, you want to use, or whatever it is. Um, so I think just just go ahead and, and do what you would normally do when interacting with the database. Awesome. Uh, one question for me, uh, from me, uh, but because you described this protocol and the serialization stuff, is it available as a NuGet package or it is as a project on the on GitHub? Can we use it separately? You mentioned that we can. Yes. How we can um, find it? Like I said, it's kind of pub kernel, so it's not really designed to be used separately. Mm. Um, as in, it's not exposed yet. But okay. once we release the next version of Orleans, it will be on NuGet. It'll be a package you can download. Um, mm. You can pull the SDK into your projects. Um, and you can customize a lot about it. So for example, that same RPC system also supports customizations that allow us to do distributed transactions and, and things without having to actually modify that RPC system itself. Mm. And there are some demo apps in there that talk about, one of them is a demo of a, a workflows application. Um, and there are some other simple RPC demos you can actually also tunnel that RPC over gRPC if you want mm. and and kind of supercharge gRPC to allow you to do, say, generic methods and um, methods with multiple parameters and, and all those kinds of things. Awesome. So currently we so, can customize it inside Orleans and you plan to uh, extract it so it will be available as a nugget and we can yeah, play with it. Yeah, we haven't published a stable version of vNext yet, um, mm. but as soon as we publish previews, it'll be available to be used. Nice. By the way, do you have any series like the Steven is my, making this performance improvement in .NET series? Do you plan to do anything like that for all links? Because it seems you are implementing there are a lot of nice stuff. So someone should sit <laughs> and write down all this awesomeness yeah, yeah. that you are doing. It's, Probably you're, you. You're totally right. Uh, <laughs> I can't just do a series of videos. I think we need blog posts and, and things yeah. that explain all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Awesome. You're right. So let's ask the very last question because we have some more. You can always answer on Twitter probably if I'm not uh, saying that. But uh, the question is about the connection handling and pools. How so how does like? Orleans handle connection pools? It's all depending on the particular database provider that you use. Um, so there are a lot of providers up on GitHub and NuGet that you can pull in. And so each one will have its own, you know, like for example, MongoDB's, uh, the MongoDB provider on the Orleans Contrib org on GitHub, I think MongoDB handles its own pools. And so the, the Orleans adapter for that, that's in that repo, it effectively just naively um, makes calls against it. And it's the responsibility of the MongoDB client to handle pooling. But otherwise, you have a lot of control. You know, the interface for doing um, persistence in Orleans is very simple. It's, it's like a read method, a write method that takes an ID and returns an object, that, that kind of thing. Um, and so a lot of people just to say, I want to have particular control over how I do something, and they'll create their own provider for it. Uh, maybe it controls the shape of the data, or maybe it controls the way that they interact with the database, anything like that. Um, thankfully, it's relatively easy to build your own. Yeah, if if the internal uh, implementations you know are not suitable for you. Thank you. So very last question, because Jose is asking us, please, please ask it. So <laughs> I'm doing that. What is your uh, the difference between Orleans and Microsoft App, or however it is spelled. Yeah, th there is there is a lot of differences. Um, I probably can't go fully into it. It's kind of similar to with Acker. You really got to have a look at them both and 
and determine for yourself. But um, but basically, actors are a part of Dapper. Um, Dapper has very substantial architectural changes, which is like, for example, every application involves a sidecar, and so there's a lot more interaction there. Um, Dapper's actors are inspired by Orleans because they are based off Service Fabric's actors before them, um, which is based in turn off of Orleans. So the API for actors is ostensibly a little bit similar, um, and the paradigm is still virtual actors, but um, Dapper actors don't have as many features like what I showed before. Um, a lot of this kind of stuff, for example, is not available in Dapper. The way that Dapper handles persistence is very different. Instead of being in process, they use this sidecar approach, which is, you know, it's it's interesting. It's arguably a good good alternative. Um, and, and a few other things, but, but yeah, again, you really kind of got to go and, and look at them for yourself, but also mm -hmm. Dapper is not just actors. They do things like, um, service invocation and, you know, secrets management and, and a bunch of other things that are very kind of Kubernetes. -y. Yeah. And the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, uh, like, uh, Orleans is much more .NET oriented and Dapper is mm -hmm. from scratch agnostic like any language on talking with any other so probably this yeah. limits also some feature set and other stuff so yeah of course it's not going to be it's kind of the lowest common denominator exactly. right when you try to support every language dotnet is kind of unique in a sense it has a very rich type system um, and a lot of that can't be expressed very well over protocol buffers um, for example or or just generally in a cross-platform way but sure. that being said, you know, if you want polyglot, then that is useful. I'm not 100% sure if Dapper's actors are cross-plat. I think you can do cross-plat stuff if you do HCDP invocation, but I'm a little bit hazy on those details. Exactly. But that's exactly the, the difference. Like they, they, There is no one-to-one no -one correspondence. Okay. Thank you, Robin. I, I believe we covered all the questions. It was awesome. Uh, it is always nice to see some tricks in serializers. So <laughs> we have some, and that was really, really nice. So we are waiting for this series of videos or blog posts about that, feel inspired to talk about it. And thank you very much. We will meet somewhere probably on the internet, on the real life maybe. So have a nice mm -hmm. rest of day and we will see you soon on the next session. So bye. Thank you.